So I think it's, good, it's time for us to get started with the program. Um, and, I, and I'd like to uh, first thank the 45 sponsors. Um, as I shared with you earlier, we have authored a document that, that presents to you six or seven steps and ideas on how you can save billions of dollars in modernizing your network infrastructure. It is not a brocade sales and marketing pitch. It's a set of thought leadership and ideas on network modernization that matter to this community. Okay. The 45 sponsors that are here participated in some way, shape, or form in that document, and we'd encourage you to spend time with them during the breaks at lunch and afterwards. Okay, so let's get the program started. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Lloyd Carney and Wyatt Cash. Lloyd is the CEO of Brocade. He is an expert in the area of software-defined network and virtualization, having built, built and sold a couple of companies there. He built uh, Juniper, uh, up to almost a $4 billion company as the COO. Since he joined uh, Brocade, he's bought back stock, reduced debt, uh, driven shareholder value, bought four companies in the area of software-defined networking, and has made a profound impact on the network of the future. He will be joined in a fireside chat by Wyatt Cash, who's an award-winning editor and journalist and a recipient of the G.D. Crane Award um, and has spent over 20 years as the editor of Information Week. So Lloyd and Wyatt, please join us on the stage. Oh, good morning, everybody. You might need some of that. We might. Thank <laughs> you. All right. So, yes, this is us. Well, great. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd just like to start before we begin our questions, noting that you know, I think this event comes at a really important time in government. And uh, I think CIOs for the government have probably never faced more challenges to deliver their enterprise IT um, more cheaply, more rapidly, and uh, more securely. And uh, I'm excited to chat with you a little bit about some of your thoughts on uh, on that, and, uh, and I'd like to get started real quick because I know we're on a tight question, a tight, tight schedule rather. But uh, Lloyd, I, I think one of the first questions I'd like to ask is: uh, Government agencies continue to wrestle with the challenge of network modernization as a whole, and so um, I thought one place to start would be kind of getting your view of, you know, what you, how you would characterize or define the, the modern network as you see it today. So first of all, I want to thank everyone for being here, and um, thank Anthony and his team. Uh, great turnout. It's my third year here now, and, and um, every year it's gotten better, better participation, and a um, much broader audience. And want to take the time to also thank the audience. I mean, you serve our country, the people who are here, whether you're suppliers, whether you're actual um, civilian employees, whether you're defense employees, you serve our country, and this is... Um, the work you do is very valuable and very important, and this is something that we at Brocade take very seriously, being able to support you and what you do every day. Um, you know, the country has been through pretty trying times the last 10 or so years, fighting many battles, and, and people refer often to the one percenters, and when they talk about the one percenters, they talk about the one percent wealthy, and you and I both know the real one percenters are the one percent who fight our wars for us, mm. and uh, you are the ones who really count, and I want to tell you, thank you again for your service, and we are here to, to serve you. Um, the question in, in, um, about modernization, uh, it's one of those things where I, you know, I spent the last couple of days you know, here in the Beltway and we had uh, quite a, a, a good audience last week at our facility. Uh, we had Terry Halverson there and he brought a team from across the Department of Defense. And so we spent quite a bit of time talking about the challenges that are here. And Anthony talked about you know, the modernization of the network, the fact that the network we have today was rolled out in the 1990s. You know, there were you know, maybe 100 million users out there, and now there's you know, billions of users, and then all, every number you look at is up to the right, exponentially different. But the way I look at it is a little differently. Uh, but being in, in the security space for a while, our networks were rolled out in place. We continue to feed and cure those networks since 1990, 95, whatever, um, the Chinese put in place a cyber arm about 10 years ago. They have a cyber arm that is on par with their Navy, Air Force, Marines. That's how seriously they take it. 
So the Chinese have at that level, the Air Force, Marines, Navy, a cyber warfare group that has been in place, focused on attacking us, post the deployment of our networks. In just basic terms, they're ahead of us. They're ahead of us because they've been rolling out more modern equipment. They're ahead of us because they rolled out their infrastructure after we deployed ours. They know exactly what we have, and you're seeing it every day when we went in the discussion we had in the last couple of days. The threats that we face are asymmetrical threats in the, in, on the warfare front and also the network. It's no longer, you know, put a firewall up around this infrastructure and defend your infrastructure with a firewall. They're inside the firewall. They're inside the compound. And they're using modern tools against us. So it, it's imperative for us, not just on the, the defense, also on the civilian side, you see breaches there, that we modernize our infrastructure. Because the bad guys, whether it's the Russians or the Chinese or the Iranians, they're using modern tools to attack us, modern infrastructure to attack us, and we're behind. Well, yeah, it reminds me really of the, it's sort of the Sputnik of our times. That we need to really be using that as a clarion call uh, to modernize our systems. I know one of your themes, and Anthony mentioned it too, is this idea of open platforms at the network level. And I was wondering if you could share a little of how you see that evolving and uh, how that specifically can work in the federal government. Well, open is, is, some people look at open and they think about increased threat because it's, you know, like the, the door is open, you know, anybody can come in. In a networking sphere, it actually leads to innovation. If you think about the cell phone that you all carry with you and you think about your, your telephone device 20 years ago, you know, so your mobile phone is this brick that you carried around, right? Um, and if you think about what you have today, you have a platform in your hand that is open. I mean, the, 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 if Apple has an ecosystem. Multiple vendors can put solutions on there. The Android guys have an ecosystem. Multiple vendors can put solutions on there, best of breed solutions. So think about the innovation that happened on that mobile platform because it was open. Think about what would have happened if... Apple came out with a phone and said, you know what, nobody can put any apps on this but us. If, 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 the, if Android came out and said, nobody but Google can put apps on this phone. So the, the best analogy for open is, look at the flexibility you have on the platform that you carry on every day. The feature functionality, ease of use, how the cost of that device was driven down because of you know competition you have you know two two choices out there today and so open means not so much about interoperability open is about a flexible stack having a a, a stack that is your compute layer from dell hp and ibm that's all um, your network layer from brocade cisco juniper and within that network stack having solutions that are interchangeable, that are best of breed solutions. And of course, the bottom of the stack is storage infrastructure. So open drives down cost, open provides flexibility, open enables you to have best of breed solutions, and enables you to scale. And so to, for, for us, it's an imperative. And if you just think about, I've been in networking business for you know, over 25 years now, and I reflect on how much time it used to take us to develop new protocols and new solutions in networking space, yeah, probably one-tenth of time now. Because we have open solutions, you know, we use more modern tools to develop this code base, to test the code base, verify the code base. So even the time for me to deliver solutions to you is greatly enhanced because of an open solution. And so you as a customer, um, your end customer, civilian that you serve, the warfighters that you serve, will have better solutions, um, more cost-effective solutions if they're based on open solutions. Uh, I think one of the big issues that we all appreciate is the extent to which government has its legacy systems and how difficult it is to take these first steps. And one of the themes of the conference seems to be, um, you know, break the network status quo. What, what does that actually mean? And how, how, how does government really start taking those first steps uh, in light of what you're seeing? 
Yeah, you know, again, to my earlier point, you know, good news, bad news, we started first. This is good news, bad news is we started first. So, so status quo reflects on what we have, how we have purchased a networking layer. Um, if you think about any layer of the compute model, uh, if you think about um, systems integrators, um, Lockheed Martin, who's here, uh, they're the you know, significant player in the SI space here in the Beltway. They've been around over 100 years. Their share of the market is about, I think, 17, 15% of the SI space. Um, because there's competition, there's healthy competition. Um, if you think about the compute layer, uh, you've got Dell, HP, IBM. Think about the number one player in that space has about 20% of that market space. And that's healthy. That's what you want. Now, those numbers are about where you are if you have a healthy competitive environment. Uh, you look at the storage space, um, you know, EMC, Hitachi, NetApp, around 17, 18% the number one players have in that space. That's a healthy environment. That's a healthy competitive environment, provides better solutions. Then you get to the networking layer. Cisco has 86% share. That is not healthy. That does not serve our war fighters well, does not serve our civilians well. That is not right. Again, healthy EMC storage guys, around 20%. Um, server guys, IBM, uh, uh, HP, Dell, you know, 20 something percent. Um, systems integrators, you know, 17, around 20%. 86% one vendor, unhealthy. That is the status quo. We have to change that. It is not, does not serve our citizens well, does not serve our war fighters well. And so what's the end result of that? It'll be a cost or higher. Every, every analysis ever done shows that if you have a, a dominant single vendor, you have higher costs. Um, you have a situation where you don't get innovation because people become complacent. So breaking the status quo means we have to change that paradigm. Um, we have to look to, and there are vendors who provide these products besides you know, that one vendor. I mean, and not just us. I mean, there again, I, I, I talked about you know, other vendors. You know, there's Juniper, there is Arista, there is um, uh, all sorts of people in that space you can buy products from. So the status quo has been broken if you're gonna get to an open solution, become, get agile solutions, and enable you to compete, you know, develop a defense against this asymmetrical network um, attack that's coming to the network. And so that's what we mean by breaking the status quo. Mm -hmm. Well, another theme that I understand is, the, is uh, in a lot of the programs today is about thinking big, and we can associate a lot of things with that. How do you uh, want the audience, how do you want government to think about thinking big uh, as they spend today here and go about their business? So one of the things we, we reflect on when we discuss this, you know, think big but start small. There, there is, on this open journey, on this next generation new IP network, there is uh, software defined networking, there is network function virtualization, there are fabrics to be deployed, and so and there's you know open stack solutions. So there's a myriad of things that some of you've never heard about before that take you on this journey. And we have customers, partners who are you know fully committed to this journey of software defined network function virtualization. And, and the best analogy for all of this is is again about your PC. You think about uh, your the cost of your PC today or your, your, I, your, your tablet you carry around, it has dropped dramatically. Your PC you carry around now is more powerful than super mini computers from Digital Equipment Corporation and, and DEC and Prime you know, 15 years ago. That laptop you walk around with is that much more powerful. You are able to do a lot more on a cheaper platform than you ever were able to do before because of what Intel has done at AMD in driving down the price point. Well, Intel is doing the same thing in networking space. Intel is driving down the price point, and they're putting more networking-like functions on their, on, their, on their chip. So you can 
as a, as, a, as a networking executive, you can now take advantage of what Intel has done the way HP, Dell, and IBM did in taking advantage of what Intel did in driving down the, your laptop prices. And so you can run network functions on a PC-like machine. As powerful as you were able to run on dedicated machines from us, from Cisco, from you know, you name the vendor, you can now deploy much more cost-effective CapEx platforms to run your networking function. So that's that's when we talk about, you know, think big, start small. Um, you can start looking at where is it that you can choose to use an Intel-based machine versus an expensive dedicated piece of equipment. I mean, too much of, of what we spend today in networking in the civilian and the, the government agency is, is spent on maintaining these old platforms. Something like 10, 15% of every spend is, is, on, is on new. 85% is maintaining old. Who would ever do that? But we do that. I mean, think about your home. You know, you have a fridge, you've got, you've got a microwave, you've got television sets. You buy these products. And you don't spend 85% every year maintaining those products. You never do that personally. You buy a car. Do you spend 20% you know, of the cost of the car every year? No, you don't. Nobody does that. But somehow we've gotten into this malaise in the network where we think that's OK. We don't spend that kind of money on anything, not, a, not on the compute. You know, if, if HP said you're going to spend 85% you know, maintaining your servers every year, you'd laugh them out the room. Right? So we need to realize that we, you know, we get to change a paradigm networking space. We have to spend more money on new things and new solutions and less money maintaining the old things that we have. Because again, I started talking about this. Our competitors don't have that problem. I guarantee you the Chinese aren't spending 85% of every dollar on old stuff. I guarantee you the Russians aren't doing that either. So you know, we have to start somewhere, and there's easy places to start, fabrics. The fabrics that we deploy today, networking switches, they need less people, they take less money to, to, to purchase per port, draw less power, take less space, it's just all around a better solution. And it does more than what the old switches do. So why would you buy a fabric? The fabric, you, you pl the one of the strengths of the fabric, and again, you can buy a fabric from us, you can buy a fabric from Cisco, you can buy a fabric from other vendors. You shouldn't buy traditional switches. You should buy fabrics because they auto-learn, which means you just plug them in and it works. They figure out what needs to be connected to what. Your engineers have to spend hours configuring these boxes. They auto-learn. They auto-load balance, which means they figure out where the traffic is and automatically you know, shifts traffic patterns around. Why would you buy a traditional switch? It's like, you know, you, you went to the airport, and the guy said, here's a car you can buy, you can rent, it has no AC in it, it's going to rent, cost you $100 a day, it's, you know, June in, in, in Washington, D.C., and here's a car over here that is half the price, you can rent it for, you know, $20 a day versus $100 a day. This one has AC, this one doesn't have AC. Which one are you going to take? You know, you take the $20 car with AC versus $100 car without AC. That's the difference between the old switches and new switches, which we still buy. Why would you buy that technology where you need more people to manage it, it costs you more to run it over time, it's just not a logical thing to do. So you can actually start by just changing, deploying fabrics. The fabrics you deploy, you'll be able to layer these software-defined functions, these network function virtualizations on top of it, to improve the manageability, usability of the network over time. So that's where you'd start. You start at the, at, the, at the level of where the fabrics are. And we have customers here in the Beltway, by the way, who have the wherewithal and the skill set to go all the way to SDN, software defined networking, network function virtualization. It requires a level of competency and training in your workforce. Some of the groups here have that ability, some don't. We have, we have we were chosen for AT and T to do their next generation domain 2.0. We were the networking vendor of choice for them. They have the wherewithal of AT and T to redo the entire network end to end, and they they're going to have it completely software defined by 2018 2020. They have those resources. There are agencies here who have those resources. Most people don't. So you can start with the infrastructure. You know, stop buying the old stuff. Start buying new modern switches that enable you to get to SDN when you're ready. And that's the first step along the journey. 
Let me ask a little about the security question at the network level. Um, you know, as we move to the cloud, there was opportunities to move new applications uh, or extend services in a fairly controlled way. I mean, you know, it still took government a long time to get there because of the security concerns. And relative to the priorities of investment, um, there seem to be opportunities there. At the network level, it's a little more entrenched, but one of the the CIOs that I heard from last week was saying, my biggest challenge in selling upgrades in my network is how does it solve the security concerns that I have? How, how would you address uh, how these new investments would actually potentially improve security? So, you know, security, of course, is very topical here on the Beltway right now. And um, not in the Beltway, but in the financial institutions. I mean, I, I, I am to serve on, on the Visa board now. and. And you know the financials are as worried about the, the security issues as are the the, the, the war fighters and the, the civilian agencies. Security now needs to be layered. There is no longer any one solution for security. You have to have security at every level of your stack. You have security at your 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 server with your virus protection. You get to have security at the edge of your network, traditional firewalls. You know, um, access control lists, your storage. Um, you have to encrypt as, as much as possible. I mean, we have encryption capabilities. We can encrypt between data centers, between devices in the data center. Um, we, you know, modern s servers today. I mean, storage devices have encryption built into them. But one of the challenges that, that we have in the Beltway here is some of your networks can't be made more secure because you're running these old architectures that you're trying to bolt on security onto them, bolt on solutions onto them, and it just, you know, Tony Scott will be, will be talking here later today, and uh, Tony is someone who worked before at VMware when he was there. Um, we actually won the VMware network with our, with our solution. Um, Tony has a rich history, you know, from uh, GM, Disney, Microsoft, and then VMware, the, the premier virtualization platform. You know, he has a tough job. Um, you know, he has some heavy lifting to do, trying to secure this existing infrastructure when some parts of this infrastructure doesn't have the modern bells and whistles and, 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 and hooks in it to make it secure. Um, they're, but they're basic things that you can do, and this new architecture lets you deploy a more secure network. I mean, as, you know, my laptop is encrypted. Someone steals my laptop, good luck, you can't do anything with it, right? Um, you know, there's no, but if I had a 10 year old laptop, I couldn't encrypt the drive, the capability wasn't there on that device to do that. So there is, there are things that as we modernize, you'll be able to get more secure infrastructure. And the flexibility you have, man, an open architecture, because the, the threats that are coming to the network, again, they're people who have been designing threats for over the last 10 years to attack our network infrastructure. They're very good at what they do. It is rare if we do a deep dive in any Fortune 1000 company, any major civilian or military, if we do a deep dive that we don't find applications that shouldn't be there, that are there. That there aren't things, dormant things, that haven't been turned on yet. They've been placed there over the last 10 years, waiting to be activated. It's not by chance that you, you, when we find these threats now, it's not like someone tried to break in and we caught them at the firewall. Someone tried to break in, we caught them and they, you know, they were there for a couple of minutes before we shut the place down. When we find these threats, they've been there for a year and a half. They've been there for two years, you know, running around nefariously, doing what they, you know, un unencumbered. We need to have environments that are structured such as we can put defenses against these asymmetrical attacks. And the best way to do that is to have an open architecture, a flexible architecture, one where you can update on the fly solutions. You realize there's a threat, you can identify the threat, you can update your infrastructure stack right away. No more do we have the luxury of here's the thing we ship, we have defined it, we've tested it, and we're going to ship it for the next five years. Can't do that anymore. Whatever we ship, has to be flexible enough, agile enough, that we can, if a threat is detected against that device that we've shipped, that we've sent out in the Humvee to the warfighter, that we have installed at you know, the Social Security Department, that we can 
without having to go on site and rip things out of the wall, secure, upgrade, and, and improve the defense of that system. So the, the, the end result of an open architecture, a flexible architecture, will be a more secure infrastructure. Because security now means agility. It's not locking down a device. I mean, the most secure device you have is, is the, the, your, your diary that only you write into when you put in your nightstand and lock. <laughs> anything that you share with anybody else, anything that you plug into the wall is no longer secure. So you have to think in this new paradigm of it, is, it has been infected. There is a soon, soon the threat's already there. And what do you do when you find the threat? And how nimble can you be? And again, open architecture is, is, is a proven way to do it. It is, it is the, the only way to do it. You can then pull best of breed solutions. You know, what's the best you know, storage solution that I need to put there? What's the best um, routing solution, the best switching solution? What's the best firewall solution? It should be as simple as when you pick up your device, your, your, your Apple device or, or Google device, and you see updates, and you look at the updates you need, and you need a security update, you hit yes, and it updates your device, it's done. No one has to bring their phone back to the store to say, you know, fix the security on it, right? It, it has to be inline, software-based, flexible. That's the kind of thing that we need for our war fighters. That's the kind of thing we need for our civilians. And that's the kind of solution that you get with a, a um, SDN, software defined networking, network functional virtualization solution. Well, your point reminded me of something Tony Scott uh, said uh, just uh, last week. Uh, I think he made the analogy that trying to secure these aging enterprise IT systems is uh, akin to installing airbags on a 65 Mustang. Right. And it's, it really kind of paints the dilemma. So uh, as we wrap up here, I think the question I'd like to close with, um, I, I, you got a chance to speak to some generals at the Defense Department. Uh, I, I'm curious, what was your takeaway as you listen as an executive to their needs and, and what uh, the industry can, can do to be more responsive to help them take these first steps. Yeah, I think um, what we have uh, with, with, with Anthony's guidance and his team, we have really improved the relationship we have with the civilian agencies of the Department of Defense. Uh, again, we had uh, probably four or five generals last Friday back in, in San Jose with us. We're visiting you know, multiple um, senior execs here this week. <laughs> the number one thing that, that, that they need is, is our support as they go on this journey. Um, uh, we have to, you know, we have to stop prescribing by vendor what we buy. Um, you know, we have to change that procurement paradigm that, that and today we do it. It, might, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was shocking to me when I found out, you know, it was years ago I found this out, but we, we actually at RFPs say, you know, vendor XYZ product six is what we should buy. And we send an RFP out for that device. It's, it's a tantamount to saying, I want to buy a car, so I want to buy a Ford Escort 1976. <laughs> Go get me the best you know, solution for a car, but this is what I want. Well, that doesn't get you the best solution. It gets you a particular vendor solution. We have to stop doing that. Nowhere in, in the private sector would you ever do that. You, you, you know, the procurement people would have a heart attack if you said to them, hey, I want to have the best solution. This is it. We have to stop doing that. We have to give the CIOs, we have to give the people in the Department of Defense the flexibility to buy the best solution. We have to start defining the product based on open. We have to define the product based on functionality. We have to define the product based on ease of use. We spend too much resource maintaining these networks. We spend too much time maintaining these networks. And you're all under attack from companies like, like myself. I mean, if you think about, again, the challenge Tony has and Terry Halgerson has, every major financial has a cyber group now here in the Beltway. Every major hosting company, search company, has a cyber group here in the Beltway. And as dedicated as you all are, and, and it, 
and you want to serve our country and you do a great job serving our country, how often are you going to say no to someone offering you three times your salary and you can stay right where you are and keep, you know, keep your kids in the same school and stay where you So we have to solve this problem by making it easier for us for the, 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 the civilian agencies of the fence to manage these networks, to be able to deploy these networks, to be able to, to, to be competitive. We're not competitive now from a network standpoint with the people who we compete with. Yeah. And that's a problem. We need to help them fix that. Well, I'm afraid we have to wrap it there. Uh, Lloyd, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Let's give Lloyd a great round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.